Well, good morning, church. Here we are. We find ourselves back online once again and we continue to wonder how long it's going to last for. How long, oh Lord? That is an age-old question. Many before us have wrestled with God through all sorts of challenging times, struggling to comprehend God in the midst that they saw around them in the world. And Habakkuk was one such man of faith who struggled to comprehend what seemed to him like God's inaction in the face of great wickedness and oppression that he saw around him. His opening complaint in the first chapter of the little book of the Bible that bears his name begins, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? And over the next few chapters, the Lord answers his various complaints and Habakkuk learns to rest in God's timing and to trust God regardless of the circumstances of his life. And the book concludes with Habakkuk's statement of faith. From uh, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, he says this, Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, although there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And that very same sure-footed confidence is available to all, regardless of whatever life may throw at us. It is available to all who daily choose to put their trust in God. Would you join with me in prayer? Father God, many all over the world today would echo Habakkuk's cry, How long, O Lord? Our televisions and our mobile devices are for us a window into the world and as we look through that window, many of us don't like what we see. We see plenty of what Habakkuk saw. We see violence and we see injustice. We also see plenty of sickness and death and poverty and oppression And in the midst of all of this darkness and uncertainty, you alone, Lord, you are our light. You are our unchanging rock to whom we cling. Your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Teach us, Lord, to wait patiently in a spirit of worship. May our joy be independent of our circumstances because it has its source in you alone. Our God, who is rich in mercy, abounding in grace, and is the same yesterday, today, and always. In the uncertainty of our external circumstances, may we be sure-footed like the deer, because our hope is in you and in you alone. We love you and bless you, Lord. Amen. Well, these are indeed uncertain times that we face and at this stage we know that we will be locked down until Tuesday night. Beyond that, we wait uh, government advice. So if you're a regular member here at Pathway, part of our church family, just keep an eye on those emails that come out from the church office and we'll let you know what's happening with our ministries and regular programs and special events that have been planned for this week and on into next week. Well, Pathway's newest parents are going to lead us now in a song titled, Lord, You Are My God, before Pastor Glenn comes and speaks to us from the second half of Ephesians chapter 3.
This morning, our meditation comes from Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 14 to 21. We are going through the book of Ephesians. We are reaching this final bit of the first section. As we already mentioned, the book of Ephesians breaks into two parts, chapter 1 to 3, and then chapter 4 to 6. So this is the final bit of the first section. And it is actually serves as a bridge between the two sections. It is a transition uh, from doctrine to duty. It's a transition from belief to behavior. It is a transition from explaining about our positions of the Christian to the practice of the Christians. It is transition from privileges of the Christian to responsibilities of the Christians. 
And so we are coming now to this bit of prayer, beautiful prayer that Paul preached as a way to transit into that part of more practical application of what he has been explaining about the first bit of it, about doctrine. And he begins in chapter 1 to 3, the contents of the Christian's heavenly bank account, adoption, acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit, life, grace, citizenship, in short, all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ and drawing upon the huge spiritual endowment, the Christian has all the resources he needs to live a life worthy of the calling of God. And so for the first three chapters, Paul has dealt with doctrine in which he has described our spiritual possessions in Christ and our spiritual position in Christ. And then starting next week, we'll move on to chapter 4 to 6, that Paul is going to focus on the duty, the responsibilities that are ours because of the blessings we enjoy. And there are a number of things that we'll be talking about, about walking in unity, walking in truth, walking in love, walk, walking wisely and all that. So let me ask you to turn with me to chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. I'm going to read it through and I want to unpack this beautiful prayer that serves as a bridge between the two sections. Chapter 3, verse 14 says this, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people, Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There's one wonderful thing to begin with is that Paul prayed about many things, but interestingly, this is a very unusual prayer in a lot of ways. Firstly, Paul doesn't pray for anything about the circumstances. Most of the time when we pray, we pray for certain circumstances, certain needs of the people, but Paul didn't do that in terms of praying for anything about the circumstances of the people that he's praying about. There's nothing wrong with praying about circumstances, of course, but Paul teaches us that there's something even bigger. Because most of us think that if our circumstances change, then we would change. But Paul knows that circumstances don't make us who we are. If Paul prays, is answered for us, then we can truly change even if the world around us stays completely the same. So the first thing to notice about this prayer is that Paul didn't pray for anything about changing of their circumstances at all. And the second thing about why this prayer is unusual, it is that it is a very emotional prayer. You notice that from uh, in verse 14, it says that Paul said, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. It is a very emotional prayer. I mean, it is not unusual to see someone bow to prayer. In some tradition of a church, you can even kneel down with a stool in front of you, provided for you to kneel to pray. And uh, so it's not unusual. But when Paul wrote this letter to his people, 
the culture at that time, they don't generally kneel to pray. They do, but the normal posture for the Jewish people to pray is that they will, they will stand. So why did Paul kneel? I don't know, I could only guess, probably because this prayer carries some emotion, very strong. This isn't just a cold intellectual prayer. There's some emotion behind what Paul is going to pray, and I'm going to unpack it for you. It's a beautiful prayer about power in our lives. And here Paul begins by saying and gives us the reason that he prayed this prayer for the people. He said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. For this reason, what reason? Again, it is probably just past, just referring to this mystery that has been revealed, that God has included the Gentiles, and God is going to display this through the church, isn't it? In verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And so after Paul set out God's purpose for the church, he described his own prayer for the body of Christ. But I think there's also another reason why Paul makes this prayer, which is just before verse 14, in verse 13, Paul mentioned to them, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged or disheartened because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. We mentioned that Paul at this time was either house arrest or in prison, and he wrote the book of Ephes uh, letter of Ephesians. And uh, he said, I don't want you to be discouraged because of my suffering. Even Christians tremble and shake and become anxious and burdened and concerned that they can't resolve their problems and they can't control their environment and they can't take charge of their circumstances like what we are now in. And therefore, sometimes we can get discouraged, we can get down, we can get depressed, we can get despair, and we can allow the circumstances to overwhelm us as believers. But life can be very much like that, as I just mentioned. And, and Paul is basically writing on that mentioning about the prayer for the, about the purpose of the church and mentioning about his own situation. And Paul just don't want them to be the kind of people who lose heart because of trouble. And so he said, for this reason, I'm going to pray for you that rather than being weak and disheartened, you are going to be a powerful people. You are going to write above the circumstances as believers and as disciples of Jesus Christ. You're going to write above that. And I'm going to tell you that, Paul said, I'm going to tell you that you have the resources available to help you to live beyond being affected by the circumstances of your life. I don't want you to be on a short end. I don't want you to stumble around and bumbling around in weakness, just trying to crawl around. And Paul is saying, I want you to live beyond that, that you are able to rise up above the circumstances that you may be in. And so, Paul said, I bow, I kneel before the Father, the Father who is really the one behind every family in heaven and on earth, the Creator God. And I'm going to ask Him to do a mighty work in you. And so for those reasons, two reasons I mentioned, Paul begins his prayer. And I think this is a transition that he just mentioned about who we are and before he launched into what we are then supposed to do, Paul is going to make this powerful prayer for us believers, giving us a perspective of how we are able to then go on to live out as a Christian. So I break up this uh, section of the prayer into two points that Paul prayed for us. So the first one is in verse 16 and 17. Number one is that Paul prayed that God will strengthen us with power. God will strengthen us with power. Paul prayed that God will give us power so that we are changed within. Not just power in general that Paul is asking for, but this power that Paul is asking God for his people is toward a specific purpose. Power that we would be changed in the depths 
of our being. That is where verse 16 and 17 says, He said, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit. Where? In your inner being. Paul is praying that something will happen in what he calls your inner being. Something God will give you the power to strengthen through His Spirit in your inner being. This is the inner part of us that no one sees. The part that makes you who you are, your inner being. Paul is praying for the very essence of who we are at the very center of our personalities. And what does Paul pray for our inner beings? He prays that we'll be strengthened with power through the Spirit. And the purpose of this prayer, that God will strengthen us in our inner being, for what? It says in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul doesn't pray that we'll have a power that will improve our standing with others or get us more of what we want. But Paul says the power Paul prays for is that the inner part of us will become a place where Christ can make his home. The inner sanctuary of your personality, your who you are, he said God will give you power to strengthen your inner being so that Christ can dwell there. Christ can make His home, your heart, His home, dwell here. The word dwell uh, can have two meanings in the original word. Uh, it, it can mean to inhabit a place as a guest. Kind of like you stay in hotel when you go holidays for a number of days, Airbnb, you can dwell in that place, you can stay in that place for a number of days. You don't even need to unpack your suitcase. You certainly don't strip off the wallpaper uh, if you don't like it, or you make plans to remodel the place because it's not, not just any, it's not yours. You're only there for a few days. You're only temporarily dwelling in that particular place. But that's not the word that Paul used when he used, say, the word dwell. It's a strong word that actually means taking up permanent residence to really settle down. Paul's praying that our inner beings will be strengthened so that Christ may may really settle down and live there. And if Christ lives at the very center of our beings, it's going to mean only one thing, and that is transformation. But I want to ask another question. Maybe some of you have that in your mind. Because when we become Christian, Christ dwells in the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We know that Christ already dwells within believers. So why would Paul pray for something to happen that's already happened? It is not talking about it's talking about sanctification process. It's a bit like you 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 manage to save some money, you 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 buy a house, but it's not exactly a, a, a beautiful house that has been done up nowadays that you put in, people put in some money and do it nicely and then sell it as it is. Uh, you bought a house that you need to put in a lot of money to actually change a lot of things. Uh, it needs a lot of work. The wallpaper but it needs to come off. The carpet is disgusting. The basement maybe is full of junk from the previous owner. The kitchen was designed you know, in the a, in a 50s. The roof leaks and the insulation barely meets the minimum standards. And, and, and you have to put in a lot of money to change and renovate the place. And so, so you rip it up and you clean up and, and then you start to stay there. You start looking like a home. 
you really feel like it is home after you've done all that for a little while and you settle in with your wife, your children, your husband, and, and everything settles in. And that's exactly, and everything settles in. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. When Christ takes up residence within us, he finds the equivalent of a lot of things that need fixing in our lives. And Paul is praying that God will give us the power to strengthen our inner being so that Christ may live there. And when Christ lives there, He's going to do a lot of changes in our lives. He moves into our inner beings and He does begin and begin to clean, to repair, to expand. And over time, our inner being, dwelling places, begin to reflect who lives there. And our inner beings become dwelling places that reflect His character. And so Paul prays for that. Paul pray for that. C.S. Lewis said that the Christian life is simply a process of having your natural self change into a Christ self. And that this process goes on very far inside. One's most private wishes, one's point of view, are the things that have to be changed. I like a, I read a book by uh, Dallas Willard many years ago, uh, a book called Renovation of the Heart. Beautiful title, Renovation of the Heart. And it kind of speaks of, of what Paul's prayer is, that create this inner life chamber, like a house that Christ dwell in there, and then Christ can begin to renovate our heart, do a renovation. Maybe there's a study room there. Maybe it's your mind. Maybe there's a, a living room. Maybe there's a kitchen there, the compartments of that. The Christ is going to renovate the way we think, the way we fellowship, our appetite in the kitchen. Jesus is going to do a mighty work in the renovation. And Dallas Willard, in the book Renovation of the Heart, he says this. He said, the hidden dimension of each human life is not visible to others, nor is it fully graspable even by ourselves. We usually know very little about the things that move in our own soul, the deepest level of our life or what is driving it. Our within is astonishingly complex and subtle, even devious. It takes on a life of its own. And only God knows our depths, who we are, and what we would do. And therefore, the book invites us to have allow Christ to enter it and do some major renovation of our hearts. And so this is Paul's first prayer. He prayed that God will give us the power to strengthen our inner being. And the purpose of that prayer is that so that we can make it like a house for Christ to dwell there. And so the first prayer, the word that you have to remember is dwell. Permanent resident. Allow Christ to dwell in your heart, the deepest recesses of your heart, that He is your guest. He lives there permanently with you. And the most beautiful part about this part of the prayer is that Paul tells us how it happens. It is so important that we see how this happens. It's not the result of some kind of self-improvement program. Look at verse 16 again. Paul prays in verse 16 that it is according to the riches of His glory. And not just only according to the riches of His glory, also He mentioned through His Spirit. According to God's riches and through His Spirit. It is Him that is at work in us, changing and molding us. But at the same time, the verse also tells us it doesn't totally cut us out of the picture because it also says through faith. You see, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit, that is His work, 
in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So this is something that God does. It is based on the glorious riches of Jesus Christ secured by Him at Calvary, but on our part is by faith. We trust that Jesus will do this mighty work in our lives. So what Jesus did for us at the cross is more than enough not only to save us, but to change us in our innermost beings. The power comes not from us, but from the glorious riches of Jesus Christ that are applied to us through the Spirit. So this is the first part of, the, of Paul's prayer. It's not just that we believe certain things. This prayer is about much more than believing certain truths about God. It's that we will be increasingly transformed in the very depths of our being by the one who has taken up residence in our heart. So this is the first prayer. The second prayer is in verse 17 to 19. Is prayer. The second prayer is a prayer that we will understand. Not just only understand, more than that, we probably experience, it might be used a stronger word, we understand, we know, we experience the limitless dimensions of Jesus' love for us. So that's the second prayer, that we will know, we will understand, we will experience the limitless dimensions of Jesus' love. And he said, and I pray, look at verse 17, the second part, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So the first word that I want you to grasp is, is uh, dwell. And the second prayer, the words that to remember is grasp. To grasp. Paul prays for something in a sense that's clearly true. He prays that we will grasp the love of Christ. I mean, most people who are Christian get this at some level. I mean, it's way back in Sunday school, we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. All of us Christian knows, in some sense, of uh, uh, the love of God. We, we heard sermon over and over and over again, and we know that's the fundamental foundation for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, and all that. So, so on one level, we get it, but but there's another level, we don't get it. We have this picture of God who, who seems to be perpetually disappointed with us. We try to obey God, but for a lot of us, the motivation is about duty or obligation rather than as a response to God's love for us. And so this is Paul's prayer for us, that we will not just know about Christ's love, but really grasp it. You even see this in Paul's prayer, is that we will know something that surpasses knowledge. Is that what? Is that we'll really get it, is it? Really, really get it. He seems to emphasize that this prayer is something that surpasses knowledge. I want you to really get it. I want you to really grasp it. He earnestly desires for them to grasp it. Or in King James Version, he said, able to comprehend. Paul said, I really want you to get it. You must understand this. He seems to say that if you have difficulty grasping his love, you will have difficulty with everything else. Why I say that? Because he says again, just at the first part of his prayer, that you will have power to strengthen your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart. That's the purpose. It's the second thing. Second prayer is the same thing. He said that, I want you to grasp this love of God. What for? In verse 19. So that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's almost like saying that if you cannot grasp 
the full comprehension of God's love, then you in some way will not be able to fail to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's almost by saying that this grasping of God's love for you is the foundation. It is a fundamental part of the Christian building blocks in all other things so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This means essentially that we will become spiritually mature so that we will become all that God wants us to be. He said, if you don't grasp back that, then you cannot reach this state of spirituality, this maturity of this attaining this full measure Full to the measure of all the fullness of God. And so, in other words, if we are to grow spiritually into the people we are meant to be, Paul is saying that it begins with grasping, really getting the limitless dimensions of God's love. It won't come from theological education. It won't come from years of attending church. It will come from really grasping Christ's love so that it becomes real to us, as real as the persons next to you. And Paul uses this word, uh, breath, length, depth, and height. And of course, he's not talking about four kinds of love. He's talking about the fullness or the vastness of God's love. Uh, Ken Hughes, a commentator, he writes the following about these verses. He said, It is a love which is wide enough to embrace the world, as in John 3, 16. And it's also a love which is long enough to last forever, as in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, the ending of the chapter on love, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is love. It is a love that is long enough to last forever. And then he went on to say, it is a love which is high enough to take sinners to heaven. As in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And it is also a love which is deep enough to take Christ to the very depths to reach the lowest sinners. As in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. So it is the love which is wide enough to embrace the world, a love which is long enough to last forever, a love which is high enough to take sinners to heaven, and a love which is deep enough to take Christ to the very depths to reach the lowest sinner. The four magnitudes describe an infinite, incomprehensible love. In the words of A.W. Tozer, he said, because God is self-existent, His love had no beginning. Because He is eternal, His love can have no end. And because He is infinite, it has no limit. And because He is holy, it is the queen essence of all spotless purity. And because He is immense, His love is an incomprehensibly vast, bottomless, shoreless sea. And Paul wants us to grasp that, that love. And the purpose of it is so that we can move on to the measure or the fullness of what it means to be a believer. James Packer, who died last year, uses a wonderful image to speak of God's love. He goes something like that. He said, when we study God's wisdom, we learn about His mind. When we study God's power, we learn about His arm. And when we study God's knowledge, we learn about His eyes. When we study God's Word, we learn about His mouth. When we study God's love, we learn about His heart. And here Paul is trying to help us to grasp His heart. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 and 9 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. 
if we could ever comprehend or even begin the process of understanding God's love, our lives would change. The way we worship, the way we respond to Him, the way we respond to others, the way we reach out, the way we live, the way we think about ourselves, our past, our present, our future, it will transform us when we're truly able to grasp the love of God. God's love for you has nothing to do with your behavior, if I may say. Neither your faithfulness nor your unfaithfulness alters divine love in the slightest degree, like the Father's love in the parable of the prodigal son. Love is absolutely unconditional, unlimited, and unimaginable extravagant. And until we dare to believe that nothing can separate us from God's love, nothing that we could do or fail to do, nor anything that could be done by anyone else to us, we remain forever in the elementary grades of the school of Christian spiritual transformation. Until we believe that God's love is based on nothing, and the fact that it is based on nothing makes us secure, were it based on anything else we do, and that anything were to collapse, then God's love would crumble as well. And so until we understand that, grasp it, I think we can slowly move towards true, authentic, spiritual transformation in our heart to the fullest, as, uh, as Paul uh, says this. But, uh, but the question that when we talk about this, about God's love, straight away the objection in our mind is, won't the awareness that God loves us no matter what lead to spiritual laziness and moral laxity? We discussed that uh, last Wednesday in our Bible study group as well. Uh, it, if you say God loves you anyway, so wouldn't that actually propel you towards uh, a moral laxity and, and spiritual laziness? Well, I think it's a, it's a valid question. Theoretically, I think this seems a reasonable fear. But in reality, I think the opposite is true. Because love will always call forth love. The more rooted we are in the love of God, the more generously we live our faith and practice it. Grasping God's love for us is the key that to me, that really propel us to true spiritual growth rather than abusing God's love. While that is, that is concerned, I'm sure there, there must be some people who think like that and, and abuse that. Um, but I, but I still believe that theoretically it is a reasonable fear, but in reality, the opposite is true. Love will always call for love. The more rooted we are in the love of God, the more generously we live our faith and practice it. Many years ago, I read of uh, Henry Nowen, a story I think I might have shared before uh, about this family that has 13 children. And this particular, this one of his children wrote this actually. He said, my, he said, one day when I was playing in the street of our hometown in Holland, I got thirsty and I came into the pantry of our house for a glass of water. It was around noon time and, father, and my father had just come home from work to have lunch. He was sitting at the kitchen table having a glass of beer with a neighbor. A door separated the kitchen from the pantry and my father didn't know I was there. The neighbor said to my father, You know, Joe, there's something I've wanted to ask you for a long time. But if it's too personal, just forget I ever ask. He, he said, What is your question? Well, you have 13 children. Out of all of them, is there one that is your favorite? One you love more than all the others? And this particular boy said, I had my ear pressed against the door, hoping against all hope that it would be me. And my father said, that's easy. Sure, 
There's one I love more than all the others. That's Mary, the 12 year old. She just got braces on her teeth and she feels so awkward and embarrassed that she wouldn't go out of the house anymore. Oh, but you asked for my favorite, didn't you? That's my 23 year old Peter. His fiancé just broke their engagement and he's desolate. But the one I really love the most is little Michael. He's totally uncoordinated and terrible in any sport as he tries to play. The other kids on the street make fun of him. But of course, the apple of my eyes is Susan. Only 24, living in her own apartment and developing drinking problems. I cry for Susan. But I guess of all the kids... My father went on and on and on, mentioning each of his 13 children by name. And this man who became a professor, he ended the story by saying this. He said, what I learned was that the one my father loved most was the one who needed him most at the time. And that's the way God loves us, he says. He loves those who most he loved those most who need him most, who rely on him, depend on him, and trust him in everything. So Paul here say, I want you to grasp this. I want you to know Christ truly loves you so that you can grow on to maturity. And let me finish with verse 20 and 21. A beautiful prayer of benediction that we pastors often use, but it must flow with this context. Why Paul says that we can pray these two prayers about strengthening our inner being and grasp the love of God is because God is able and God is worthy. God is able to do it. And that is why he said, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He is able, not just only he is able to do it, but not just only that he is able to do more than we ask or imagine, he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I mean, in this section, Paul is almost using superlative words to stretch to the max. How high, how deep, how, you know, breath of love of God and immeasurably more than we could ever ask. I can understand that. But I can't understand the next word that says, or imagine. Isn't it Amazing that God can even do more, greater than you imagine. I mean, is there a cap to your imagination? And Paul is saying, God can even do far greater than what you imagine in your own lives. God can do that. Because of His power, there's a work within us. Why? He did it for what? For His glory. To Him be the glory to the church. God is able to do it. God is worthy of this pursuit. And God is able to make this kind of change in our lives. Let me close to this. I didn't realize that the time flew by so quickly. Let me close off with this simple fairy tale story that if you are here present this morning, I, wonder, I will ask to see who will re tell me which story it is first. So I'm only left with Caroline to see when she spot this story. You see, once upon a time, there was a little girl who had a wicked stepmother and two ugly stepsisters. You got it? She, made to, she was made to work in the kitchen and used to sit in her rag clothes. And one day, the king invited all the maidens in the land to a grand ball in the palace, as we know. He wanted his son, the prince, to fall in love and to marry. And the ugly sisters were taken to the ball, but this little girl had no dress to wear, and she was left at home. And then, of course, the fairy godmother touched her with her magic wand, and her rags were turned into a beautiful dress. The mice turned into horses, and the pumpkin turned into a carriage, but only until midnight. 
Cinderella. But when she arrived at the ball, she captivated the prince's heart and they danced until midnight when she had to leave. She ran from the ballroom, but as she did, one of her glass slippers fell off. The prince was determined to find a woman she, he loved and ordered that the slipper be tried on the foot of every maiden in the land and that the one on whose foot it fitted should be brought to the palace. Now let's pause this story and think about Cinderella sitting at home. She is dressed in rags, despised by the ugly sisters and oppressed by the wicked stepmother. But her destiny is a life of joy in the palace. I think there's a picture of a church, of the church. It sometimes looks a bit wrecked, there are some rather ugly brothers and sisters who despise her and count her as of little value. There are parts of the world where a wicked stepmother persecutes the church and imprisons her leaders. But Christ loves the church and he will bring her to his palace. And God, the first part of three chapters, that God is telling us who we are and say that he's going to use the church as a blessing. He's one of the model in drawing and in shining of what a church that really needs to be. And as we move on to chapter 4 to 6, we're going to see what we are supposed to be living out now that we know who we are. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for loving us. Lord, our finite mind can never be able to fully comprehend the infinite extravagance love of God in our lives. But when we can grasp it, it is truly the fundamental foundation to all other things. It will help us not to propel towards becoming self-righteous. When we understand God's love, we will not become legalistic. We will live to the fullness of what you want us to live but never critical or judgmental upon others because we recognize who we are, that we are saved by grace. And therefore, God's love is so fundamental. It's a building block to all other spirituality. And we ask that you will strengthen our inner being so that we can create this home for you to dwell in there as a permanent residence, allowing you to do the work that needs to be done in our heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. As we continue to grow in you, as we continue to study this book, we ask for your blessing to mold, shape, renovate the, our inner being, that we can live to the fullness of the measure of Christ. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We now uh, invite you to sing our closing song, How Great Thou Art. My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings
shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. 